Emily Dickinson. The brain is wider than the sky. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, as syllable from sound. So it's a great honor to be able to interview Steven Pinker, John Stone Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. Pinker is one of the most renowned and influential thinkers of our time, a polymath who has made signal contributions to such diverse fields as linguistics, psychology, evolutionary theory, and intellectual history. I remember our first meeting years ago in Santa Barbara at a conference on literature and evolutionary psychology, where I was amazed by your erudition, insight, and warm collegiality. Since the Literary Universals project is about literature, I thought we might start out with some reflections on the Emily Dickinson poem that you discuss in the blank slate. First, I'd like simply to ask what drew you to this poem initially and led you to include it in your book. Well, uh, thank you, Patrick. I and I remember that meeting uh, fondly many years ago. This is in a section in my book, The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature, which I, after defending the very idea of human nature and the accusation that if you believe in human nature, you must be uh, anti-human or reactionary or reductionist, to, uh, to say that, it, in fact, uh, what I consider to be a, a rich and biologically grounded view of human nature is actually more compatible with a lot of the great themes of, of literature and poetry than some of the kind of intellectual uh, consensus in, in uh, the, the 20th century that, uh, and, and, and 21st, that uh, a lot of the um, passions that drive humans, a lot of the uh, mysteries, a lot of the conflicts are exactly the material that, uh, that great artists have dealt with for millennia and that uh, modern biologically inspired scientists are, are in some sense even rediscovering. So, and I, I love the, uh, the Dickinson poem partly because the, uh, on the one hand, it is spookily modern. Uh, and uh, as you noted to begin with, in simply referring to the brain, rather than the soul or the spirit or the mind, uh, a, a really kind of a late 20th conception of who we are. Uh, on the other hand, and this is a little kind of impish uh, observation, although it's highly modern intellectually, it is uh, pre-modern or pre-modernist in terms of its form. It rhymes, it's an iambic uh, te uh, tetrameter and trimeter, uh, it's a really traditional poem that you can say aloud with great, great pleasure, but it is mind-boggling in the ideas that it uh, that it conveys, and that I I find, and I, I'm obviously not the first, that it, it kind of repays uh, attention every time you process it and try to figure out what she's really saying. And of course, what uh, what, what she's talking about is the fact that um, it is with this organ, the brain, that our that we have the capacity to think thoughts of any scale, any scope, an infinite variety of, of, of thoughts. This is, as a cognitive psychologist, this is one of the, uh, the epiphanies about the, 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 the mind that, that gets me excited, that uh, it's obviously a finite hunk of matter. Uh, but still, we can ponder the nature of, uh, of physical reality, of moral reality, of mathematical, of logical reality, um, and so in that sense, the, the brain is wider than the sky, the sky here being a kind of symbol of the cosmos, the uh, existence. So that's the, the, the insight from which it begins, and it elaborates it in some other uh, similes and, and metaphors and comparisons that are uh, intriguing and, and uh, still some, somewhat puzzling. Thanks very much. Um, this leads very nicely to my next question. Uh, as your comments suggest, the poem's most obvious bearing on evolutionary study is that it substitutes brain 
for a term we might have anticipated, mind or soul. Using brain intensifies the feeling of paradox conveyed by the poem. As a physical thing, a human brain is clearly not as wide as the sky. That trivial falsity, as Donald Davidson would have it, forcefully signals the metaphorical quality of wit in this poem. One suggestion of the first stanza may be that sky, in fact, does not exist at all. It is a cognition-dependent entity, roughly a part of the diffusion of light through the atmosphere as we see it. Things would be different if the sky were a sphere, as in medieval astronomy. One thing that makes the first stanza strange is that the reader, quote, you, unquote, too is subsumed by the brain, though the brain would appear to be a part of a more encompassing you. The second stanza extends the puzzle through, for example, the curious phrase blue to blue. In contrast with the rest of the sentence, this suggests a comparison of the ocean with the sky rather than with the brain, perhaps because the brain includes the sky. It might be possible to make sense of all this by viewing the poem as about imagination or simulation, an adapted cognitive process central to the creation of literature, as well as any sort of counterfactual or hypothetical thought. Romantic philosophers and poets, influential at this time, often saw imagination as in effect divine, so perhaps it is not too surprising on reflection that we encounter God in the final stanza. But the way we encounter God is still confusing. For example, the stanza includes the surprising notion that the brain is to God as abstract structure, syllable, as in a constituent of a poetic line, is to physical manifestation, sound, as when one reads a poem aloud. One might have expected something rather different. For instance, the brain is to God as sound is to meaning. In sum, I see the poem as complex and suggestive in treating our conceptual and imaginative or simulative relation to the world, but enigmatic in just what that treatment entails. What do you make of it? It's uh, one of the delightful things about the poem is that it, it uh, does invite interpretation and thought on so many levels. Indeed, the sky is an arresting uh, image in comparison with this measly three pound lump. And, um, you, and you're right that you could interpret it as itself mind dependent and that it's just a, a, in a sense a visual illusion. There is no such thing as, as the sky in, term, in the language of physics or in the science of meteorology. But it's always effective style, whether artistic or even just lively prose. This is a, an issue I dealt with in my book, The Sense of Style. So what makes the difference between um, vigorous, uh, lively prose and mushy academies. And, and one of them is the use of uh, sensory imagery as opposed to abstraction, say the universe or the cosmos or reality, uh, echoed in the choice of uh, crisp monosyllables, often uh, Anglo-Saxon, as opposed to polysyllabic uh, Latinate or Greek abstractions, such as uh, the, the universe. So the sky works better at, uh, on, on both levels. Uh, the, uh, and the, um, the simile of syllable from sound is, uh, uh, I think, like a lot of artistic metaphors, and this is uh, a theme we may return to, uh, works on several levels. Uh, and this is a way in which it differs from the use of analogy in science, where it can only work on one level to be a good scientific analogy. But in, in this particular case, you identified a, uh, a way in which what, what she might have meant with that simile, namely some an abstract structure versus uh, physical reality. I actually had a different interpretation, which is that sound is a a seamless continuum, syllable is a finite scoop of it, a demarcated unit. And I, I thought of it, again, I'm not, I would not claim that this is the correct interpretation of the poem, but for me, it, it was a, a kind of, um, almost a pantheism that, uh, not in the sense of the romantic sense of nature worship, but more in the Spinozist sense of uh, God being our 
turn for the, the, the laws of, of uh, physics, the laws of reality, the laws of logic. Uh, and that the, uh, in this case, if the brain is the thinking organ, and if um, reality, the set of ideas, the set of laws making it up are, you know, extend infinitely in all directions and, and, and from the beginning of time out into the indefinite future, uh, our brains are one little sample or, 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 or chunk of it. Um, so that's another way of interpreting that, that simile. Um, wonderful. You've convinced me. I hadn't thought of that at all, uh, though it fits with the uh, acoustic phonetics image that I had in the little montage at the beginning. So that's nice. But I, 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 it, your interpretation makes a great deal of sense. So thank you. Um, it's a little embarrassing since I'm the literary person here, but uh, uh, I, I think you're right. So, um, okay, so uh, going on to uh, the next, next thing I thought we would talk about. Uh, you've written in influentially and controversially on art and literature in relation to evolution. In How the Mind Works, you write that, quote, some of the activities we consider most profound are non-adaptive byproducts, unquote. You go on to state that, quote, it is wrong to invent functions for activities that lack design. Uh, I would, uh, just to clarify for people, I, I, I assume it's okay to say by design, you mean reproduction promoting design. Um, Absolutely. Uh, merely, uh, well, I'll start the quote again from the beginning. It is wrong to invent functions for activities that lack design merely because we want to ennoble them with the imprimatur of biological adaptiveness, unquote. I, I agree completely, uh, well, almost completely. I'm a bit uncomfortable with the theoretical idea of a byproduct. I do not know the uh, technical treatments of this idea, but in discussions of literature and art, it seems to me that byproduct is used to cover at least three different sorts of phenomena. First, uh, features that never have an adaptive function. Second, cases in which a most often or initially adaptive mechanism are not adaptive. And third, simply new contexts in which a mechanism operates in the usual way and may or may not have adaptive consequences. Uh, for example, the first category might include the color of blood. Blood is red due to its composition. That composition is adaptive, but the color is just a consequence, a byproduct of the adaptive mechanisms. A case of the second sort would be our taste for fatty foods. Uh, it is a mechanism that approximates a function, but in today's society, we often encounter cases where the mechanism and function diverge so that it is not adaptive in those cases. Uh, literature might be a case of the third sort. In other words, both literature, excuse me, with literature, the issue is not whether literature is a byproduct in either the first or second sense. Rather, we need to consider the combination of usually adaptive mechanisms that are recruited in literature. We might then ask what happens to the functionality of those prior mechanisms in the new context. Are they still functional? contributing to reproduction? Are they dysfunctional, inhibiting reproduction, or neither, or either, depending on the individual work, the reader, and the context of reading? Uh, personally, I don't share most of my colleagues' enthusiasm, enthusiasm for this question, which I think is based on little more than liking the word adaptive. You know, gee, I want to be adaptive too, just like those science guys. Uh, but it is perhaps worth some consideration. Yeah, I think that's an insightful uh, analysis. I find I found it uh, interesting, and, and I, I agree with it. Indeed, there's uh, there's an ambiguity of the, with the word adaptation because in everyday life we uh, use it to mean uh, well functioning, healthy, um, constructive, uh, uh, harmonizing with the environment or with one's own goals. In biology, it's got a much more precise and pedestrian meaning. It is any uh, feature of the organism's phenotype that led its ancestors to have more babies in the environment in which the ancestor evolved. And when you realize that that's, that's what adaptation means in a technical biological sense, uh, I think it, it undercuts some of the claims uh, and, and indeed the controversy as to whether 
our various uh, instincts for art are adaptations or not. Um, that uh, and I, for something to be adaptive in the sense that it gives us a deeper perspective, that allows us to appreciate the complexity of life, that gives us insight into our own existence. I mean, these are all adaptive in the vernacular sense, yeah, right. but unless they result in having more babies, they're not adaptations in the biologist sense. And that's the sense I've been uh, writing about. Now, I realize in seeing the, uh, the controversies that these claims have, uh, have aroused, that um, in the minds of most people, a biological adaptation is, is not just a, uh, a technical concept in biology, it's almost a, a statement or a, a referendum on the value that you ascribe to a particular human trait. And so people really hate the idea that some the things they don't like might be adaptations, like dominance, like revenge, like sexual aggression where I think a reasonable case can be made that they really are adaptations in the biologist sense. Uh, whereas things that are, are it's actually often quite a stretch to show how they are adaptations in the, in the biologist sense, like music, everyone wants them to be an adaptation because that would seem to suggest that they are, they're part of human nature, they're things we ought to foster to develop our authentic selves. Uh, and that, uh, that, that, that there's that moral coloring to the issue of, uh, of adaptation. And, and another deepening the irony is the fact that there is uh, a widespread antipathy to the whole agenda of evolutionary psychology to show which of our psychological uh, traits are adaptations. People are often uh, hostile to the very idea, oh, it's just uh, uh, after the fact storytelling, it's post hoc. Uh, just so stories, you can never prove them, it's not uh, scientific, except when it comes to the parts of human uh, behavior that people want to glorify, like the arts or music. There, you know, go for it. It's, it's, uh, it bonds the group, it, uh, it, uh, it calms babies, and, and people are, are, I think, a little too quick to think up adaptive, dubi sometimes dubious adaptive functions, uh, in service of the goal of showing that they really are part of our essence. Uh, excellent. Yes, uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, if I can add, if I can add to that, do, is please. that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and I think it's in in uh, making sense both of the particular questions of what is the adaptive value of a, of a human trait, including storytelling and literature and art and music. But also of uh, just uh, uh, how we make sense of our, um, our, our, our biological crucial not to equate that which was selected for by natural selection and that which we morally or aesthetically value. Quite the contrary, a lot of the things that are uh, we should be proudest of are categorically not adaptations, yes. reading being an obvious example. And a lot of the things that, uh, that we may have been selected to do, like seek revenge, like, uh, um, like, like kill our enemies, may very well be adaptations. So let's just not confuse them. I, again, a complete agreement. I have a kind of variant on or development of that question. In the blank slate, you follow Horace and others in distinguishing the hedonic and the didactic aspects of literature a division that recurs across different traditions of literary theory, if with varying emphases. The didactic function, as you develop the idea, is often involved with hypothetical simulation, thus the sort of process that Dickinson may be addressing. For example, it seems clear that hypothetical simulation and reasoning about particular causal sequences develop as evolutionary adaptations since they allow us to imagine sequences of actions and events offline. Once these develop, we have minimal story sequences. When such sequences can be communicated, most obviously in language, then we have stories in a minimal sense. To what extent do you think that the ad adaptive functions of hypothetical simulation about particular causal sequences carry over to literature? Does literature enhance the functional that functionality or not, or does it vary with individual works, readers, and contexts? In How the Mind Works, I distinguished uh, among the different uh, genres of art, 
um, fiction, literature from uh, others such as uh, visual uh, art and music. Where it's, uh, I have not been convinced by any of the arguments that music is an adaptation in the technical biologist sense. Whereas for narrative, uh, you could, even though I think as with music, part of it may be a pleasure technology, namely some things are enjoyable. We have the, we're smart enough to engineer things. One of the things we might engineer is systems that give us uh, concentrated artificial doses of uh, pleasurable uh, uh, stimuli, pleasurable events. Uh, and so we, our auditory system uh, prefers some sounds to others and we can invent um, behaviors such as singing or uh, technology such as musical instruments that um, stimulate the, those, uh, those pleasure centers, press the pleasure buttons. And clearly we do that with storytelling, but there is, uh, one can make a plausible case that our interest in fictional scenarios is, an, is ex one of the main things the mind evolved to do, namely to play out hypothetical scenarios that obey at least uh, some, maybe most of the laws of reality, so that we don't have to engage in trial and error uh, for everything. I think Karl Popper said, so our hypotheses can die in our stead. Uh, so we, uh, and, and humans everywhere, what makes humans such a, uh, interesting and sometimes dangerous species is that we figure out ways of outsmarting nature. Uh, uh, people in, in uh, hunter-gatherer societies, the, the ecosystem that uh, is uh, in which our species spent most of its time, uh, figure out ways of, they, they plan ahead, they can, they uh, visualize things that are not there, they go from tracks to an animal and to the uh, in fact, to the beliefs and desires of the animal, so they can predict which way it went. They develop technologies such as uh, complex snares um, and, and uh, traps. Uh, and it's not just in the realm of, of gathering food that they exercise their imaginations, but they form alliances with uh, other groups. They uh, figure out ways of ambushing them and avoiding ambushes. They plot conspiracies and defend themselves against conspiracies. Uh, and so, and, and doing that can't just consist of dredging up a list of uh, things that have happened to you, because the things that have happened to you are an itty bitty subset of the things that, that could happen to you or that you could make happen. And having a combinatorial mind that can play out different scenarios, uh, figure out which ones lead to things that you want and therefore to carry them out, uh, to be aware of things that have not happened to you but could happen to you before they happen to you, these uh, are almost part and parcel of intelligence. And so uh, the, the uh, pleasure taken in weaving out uh, hypothetical scenarios and in, in exchanging them uh, I think is, is quite plausibly uh, an adaptation. One of the, perhaps one of the tests would be if you had, uh, if you developed an artificial general intelligence, a, uh, a robot that had to make its way in the physical and social world, would you give it the ability to play out scenarios? And if there was a, a, a group of them exchanging information, would they, uh, would, would it help them attain their goals if they processed hypothetical counterfactual scenarios spun out by others. Uh, yes, I think it's clear that it would. Um, I want to return to literature in a moment, but before that I want to address something uh, about other arts. In the blank slate, you develop a more complex view of evolution and art. Specifically, you write that in your view, quote, art other than narrative is a byproduct of three other adaptations, the hunger for status, the aesthetic pleasure of experiencing adaptive objects and environments, and the ability to design artifact, artifacts to achieve desired ends." Unquote. I think art is perhaps too problematic a topic for us to enter into simply because it requires some theory-neutral definition to isolate what counts as art. The extension of the concept of art could then be invoked to adjudicate rival theories of the cognitive and affective sources of art, 
but without a theory-neutral definition, we have no set of artworks that we could use to adjudicate rival theoretical claims. So I would like to focus on aesthetic pleasure. Admittedly, we do not have a good theory-neutral definition of that either. However, I think people widely share a sense of what they experience as beautiful, whether it is their child's face or the language of Mrs. Dalloway or a sunset. Could you say something more about how you understand aesthetic pleasure? Indeed, that's a vital distinction because art is a social activity that always takes place in the context of previous art. And what happens is when we become too accustomed to an art form, it uh, starts to become hackneyed or cliched or banal, and uh, that sets artists off in some new direction, sometimes simply defined as being the opposite of the previous uh, art form in, in vogue. And so art is always uh, trying to contradict the reigning conception of art uh, at, at the time, particularly beginning with modernism and postmodernism in art in the uh, 20th century. So indeed, um, art, as soon as you define it, you're setting a trap because then some artist will develop something that's not that. So uh, aesthetics is a, a and indeed non-pre-modernist art and, and non-elite art is probably closer to human nature than, than art itself. And here I have to put in a plug for a, a new book by uh, my uh, colleague and friend Samuel J. Kaiser, The Mind of Modernism where he expands the and, and deepens the kind of argument that I made in the blank slate with, with far more erudition about art forms than I have. But um, go, so going back to aesthetics, that is more like to the kind of landscape paintings uh, that, you, that, that a, a, a middle class couple puts a, a, above their couch or, or you know, a gas station calendar art, uh, pop songs, um, the, the things that quite clearly give people pleasure. There, uh, I think there's a, a, a rich intersection between um, cognitive and perceptual psychology on the one hand and, uh, and uh, art on the other, because uh, we are active perceivers. We, we don't um, kind of just sit there and let the world um, you know, beam, beam energy at us. Uh, we aim our eyeballs in certain directions, we seek out certain environments, we, uh, our ears prick up to certain sounds. When we have the ability, we simulate them to give, give us pleasure. And there, there are adaptive reasons for the things that we find uh, aesthetically pleasing. In the visual realm, just starting with kind of the, the basics that say a, a photographer would, be, uh, would, would master at first, we like uh, color and uh, contrast and sharpness and um, symmetry uh, and, and, um, uh, and repetition. Probably the um, opposite of, uh, of entropy. Uh, in fact, Rudolf Armheim had, had a book exploring this idea called Art and Entropy. In many ways, uh, aesthetics is the uh, appreciation of counter-entropic patterns in the world. If you took a visual scene, and you put it in a blender and you, you kind of uh, set it to uh, liquefy, uh, out would come a kind of beige sludge that had no uh, color, no contrast, no symmetry. Uh, that would not be a world that would have anything particularly interesting in it. You would have destroyed everything. Anything that is causally uh, effective, uh, a, a flower, an animal, uh, a landscape, something dangerous, something um, safe, is likely to consist of patterns that stand out from that kind of background uh, sludge. And uh, we tune our perceptual systems to give us the best possible uh, view. Um, we place ourselves in environments that have uh, uh, consequential objects. And of those, not just any old consequential objects, but there are certain, um, uh, certain scenes, uh, certain uh, faces and bodies that are more relevant to our, uh, our fitness than others. In the case of landscapes, here is there, there's a fascinating uh, overlap between the history of landscape art and uh, what's sometimes called environmental or ecological aesthetics, namely what kind of environment do, does Homo sapiens best thrive in and that we naturally uh, seek out and that we find ourselves most comfortable in. And features such as um, greenery, vegetation, 
fortification bodies of water are, are, are define a good environment, a productive environment for a human, overlap with, with kind of um, uh, um, middle-class bourgeois uh, aesthetic tastes, yeah. golf courses and uh, flowers uh, and so on, as opposed to um, barren moonscapes or, um, uh, or, or hom homogeneous fog. Uh, the, uh, but also things that, are, that we can enjoy, even if they're not conducive to our fitness, that even things that are uh, a danger to our fitness, we're, we're best off knowing when they occur. Um, dramatic weather, like uh, storms, uh, dangerous landscapes, like, uh, like uh, cliffs or, or mountaintops or uh, valleys and ravines, which um, might engage a feature of our aesthetics, sometimes called benign masochism, where we take a paradoxical pleasure in harmful uh, stimuli that we can administer ourselves in controlled doses. Mm. Uh, that probably, uh, and, and examples would be in the realm of taste, we often, adult tastes tend toward the uh, mildly aversive that kids don't immediately like, strong cheese and wine and hot chili peppers, uh, experiences like extreme sports, um, rock climbing and skydiving and racing, uh, cases where we are in control, we can administer the dose, and, and um, the pleasure comes in expanding our space of uh, environments that we know we can explore without getting killed, uh, as opposed to just cowering in the, the safest possible uh, cave. In, in the realm of other people, there are criteria, in the case of beauty, especially sexual beauty, there are criteria that correspond um, pretty, pretty well with, uh, with fertility, uh, uh, youth, symmetry, uh, averageness, uh, in the case of heterosexual attraction, having a face and body that is unlike that of the opposite sex, sometimes exaggerated along the continuum, so that a slightly maler than male face or body, a slightly femaler than female face and body are perceived as more attractive. Um, uh, Babies, infants, the, uh, the, the neotenous features of a large head, large eyes, small lower face and, and jaw, um, a small uh, torso. Uh, all of these things that, for intelligible reasons, make us want to be with them, uh, nurture, uh, um, can in artificial uh, versions give us a, uh, a taste of that, that, that pleasure. So the, now again, this is not the same as art, but it's the, some of the raw material, some of the ingredients that artists can either use if they want to enhance pleasure, as in traditional forms of art, or can deliberately defy in the case of postmodern, uh, conceptual, um, uh, elite, uh, avant-garde forms of art. Um, uh, yeah, excellent, thank you. Uh, so this leads to my next question. Uh, you and I certainly agree that our sense of aesthetic pleasure re relies on evolved mental processes. Um, where I sometimes seem to diverge from uh, evolutionary psychologists is in what I take those mechanisms to be. Uh, for example, whether they are fixed by environmental suitability. In Beauty and Sublimity, I argue that aesthetic pleasure is a complex response that results from a limited number of general isolable cognitive and affective processes. The cognitive processes are a function of categorization. I take it that there are three types of categorization processes, rule conformity, prototype approximation, and exemplar assimilation. Uh, uh, prototype approximation would uh, include the weighted averaging processes that you just mentioned in connection with uh, uh, a, um, a say a heterosexual male uh, preference for um, slightly more female than average women's faces, uh, for instance. Uh, the affective processes are reward system activation, which implies non-habituation, and attachment system engagement. Individually, these are all mechanisms that produce adaptive results. In other words, in and of themselves, they're adaptive. 
uh, once they exist, they produce degrees of aesthetic pleasure. For example, prototype generation involves averaging across instances of a category. As this averaging functions aesthetically, we favor left-right symmetry in faces because when we average across faces, left-biased and right-biased asymmetries will tend to balance each other out. This is one of many factors that contributes to the evolutionary function of prototyping, but it is not, I would say, specific to aesthetic, aesthetics or even to faces. Uh, one might agree or disagree with this as an account of aesthetic pleasure, but perhaps it makes clear why I tend to think uh, much evolutionary thinking in the humanities, much evolutionary thinking about art assumes too direct and simple a connection between art and evolution. And again, why I have qualms about a range of the range of phenomena covered by the idea of a byproduct. Uh, you, of course, don't have to comment on my specific proposals, but I'd like to know what you think about the degree to which literary universals or other literary or artistic phenomena are open to relatively direct evolutionary accounts. For example, symmetrical faces are beautiful because they betray no symptoms of disease, and the degree to which they are best explained by more indirect and, so to speak, layered or componential accounts. For example, symmetrical faces are beautiful because we prefer non-habitual prototype approximation with this preference being adaptive across a wide range of cases, not confined to aesthetic appreciation of faces. Yes, I know that there, those are, uh, are, are deep and uh, provocative questions, I agree. Uh, in the case of, well, let, let's start with the, the visual. Uh, in the case of symmetry, <clears throat> it, uh, I think it actually in all of these cases, I think these are fascinating empirical questions where there can be theoretical reasons why you might expect that people would find uh, symmetrical objects more aesthetically pleasing or averaged composite objects more, more pleasing. And it's a, a question of, uh, it's a, an interesting research program to distinguish them, see which one is right, which one's wrong, which nicely uh, belies the accusation that these are unfalsifiable after the fact, uh, just so stories. So in the case of uh, say symmetry, there, one possibility is that, um, uh, that, that it, this is part of our search for counterentropic patterns, that is improbable but ca and causally efficacious patterns. There really aren't a whole lot of things in the natural world that are bilaterally symmetrical, mainly um, animals when viewed head on and, and uh, other humans, and uh, they, they make a difference. Um, humans obviously make a difference. We, we befriend them, we, uh, we mate with them, we bring them up, uh, we uh, we harm them or avoid getting harmed by them. So you really want to know where the people are. Uh, and animals, you know, we eat them, they eat us. Uh, so uh, a taste for the, this improbable configuration of matter, the bilaterally symmetrical entity. Flowers would be another example, and those are, those are also biologically significant because it's often the flower that identifies the species of plant better than the sea of green of, 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 of leaves and foliage. Uh, and flowers also, foretell the, uh, uh, the, the future presence of, uh, of uh, fruit. Right. Uh, so a, a, a taste for symmetry could be kind of generic, that which is not part of the background sludge. Uh, it could be more specific that, and you, you mentioned the hypothesis, and that uh, in, in the case of mating, the reason that we find symmetrical faces uh, attractive is that uh, they're a way of assessing a, uh, healthy specimen, uh, given that we can't have innate knowledge of what a, uh, um, a member of the opposite sex looks like in the case of heterosexual attraction, because we don't know whether we're going to be with you know, dark-skinned people or light-skinned people or broad-faced or narrow-faced, so you can't build in a template for a healthy member of your tribe. But uh, if something is symmetrical, the left side is kind of a control for the right side, and if they are symmetrical, it suggests that uh, nothing has gone wrong in the developmental process of building the, the, the face and the body. Uh, in, so that's another hypothesis, and uh, part of it would, would depend on how powerful symmetry per se is as a sign for beauty, both in the case of humans and other animals, since this is a cue that shouldn't be, is not specific to humans, and whether it's true of artifacts. And clearly it is true of artifacts. We, uh, a lot of our artifacts are um, symmetrical and what we sort of think of as crude, um, you know, clumsily hewed 
uh, artifacts that are that have asymmetries are, are seen as as uh, less less pleasing to the eye. Uh, but anyway, there's a space of possibilities as to what is uh, uh, attractive and why. Same is true for um, averageness. Uh, that one hypothesis uh, again. Uh, capitalizing on developmental integrity is that um, since again you can't pre-program in a template for what a healthy member of the opposite sex looks like but across all of the variation of you know some people are fat and some people are skinny and some people their, their jaws are too big in general the average in your population is ordinarily what the target of what natural selection selects for and superimpose that on that is a bunch of you know, mutations and accidents, but the, the, the composite is probably the fittest phenotype. Therefore, that's what you should find most attractive in combining your genes with, uh, with their genes. Now that's possible, but it may be, maybe that's too specific. And in fact, there is at least one study done by a former student of mine, Jillian Rhodes, which suggests that it isn't just averaged faces we find more attractive, but averaged anything, that an average of uh, all the alarm clocks, an average of all of the... Exactly. Uh, you know, the, the kitchen spatula is, is, is uh, considered more aesthetic. Now, again, we don't know whether that itself may be a byproduct of our taste for averageness for faces, uh, or whether averageness is itself the, um, the, 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 the aesthetic trigger. But these are all interesting empirical questions that, uh, that would have to be worked out. Now, I'm sorry, this is a long prologue to your real question, which is about literature. And uh, I, um, in the case of literature, there isn't, because it's a, a verbal medium and it is extended in time and it is um, a composite, there isn't like one static image that you can analyze as easily as you can, say, a, a pretty painting. Um, but among the things that, and th these are things you've explored in, in your writings, are, are there particular uh, themes, plots, um, actions that tend to recur in the world's literatures that we find compelling to, to play out, like romance, like rivalry? Uh, are there, is there a, uh, a dynamic component that may be uh, co uh, common to different aesthetic experiences of a buildup of tension and then a relaxation to a a state of resolution or repose. It's been argued that that's what makes melodies pleasurable. Uh, we certainly know in, in, in sex, in food, in, in other domains of pleasure, we like to build up a little bit of frustration, frisson, uh, uh, uncertainty, and then resolve it uh, quickly. Uh, is that a component of compelling stories? Uh, are there certain endings that we like to see played out? Uh, and in the case, what other ingredient possibly in the case of literature? This comes from a suggestion, I've adapted from a suggestion from Donald Simons, author of The Evolution of Human Sexuality, who suggested that human consciousness, con maybe, maybe paradoxically, but, but not after he explains it, really does not um, fill itself with the expected, the habitual, the predictable. That tends to be packaged and, 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 and um, uh, kind of buried in the, the, uh, the, the, the basement, the un unconscious. Things like the laws of optics that determine whether a tilted um, uh, trapezoid is a square, the laws of syntax that allow us to make sense of sentences, uh, our digestion, our breathing, the particular muscle contractions that allow us to grasp something. That's the, all these things are what we are not conscious of. What we are conscious of is the unpredictable, the rarer, and in the and, and Simon suggested very often uh, the uh, adaptively consequential, even if rare. So that we often concentrate on cases in which it may not come along very often, if ever, but when they do, they have a big wallop on fitness. We're uh, obsessed with uh, violence, even though most of us won't be uh, victims or perpetrators of violence. And a lot of our art, and uh, again, this is something I, I, don't, I don't need to, to tell you, is uh, both high and low is about violence. Uh, Old Testament Bible stories, uh, Shakespearean uh, tragedies and histories, pulp fiction, dime novels, mafia movies, war movies, uh, video games, 
we just can't get enough of uh, violent entertainment. Uh, but you know, violence matters. Not that it happens every day, but if it does, uh, there's nothing. It, there's nothing to be more important. Uh, therefore, there may be uh, adaptive value in knowing about the possibilities of violence. What is? Uh, what are the vulnerabilities? What could protect you? What could uh, allow you to to uh, attack or defend yourself? What are the dangers? Uh, and that so you're kind of prepared with a mental playbook. Uh, should it ever occur, it may not. But if it does, uh, it's good to be prepared. Sexuality is another example. Probably, uh, especially in a monogamous society, opportunities for um, multiplying one's reproductive uh, output with uh, a, a, an adulterous sexual partner or enhancing the value of one's offspring may be rare. And uh, we, but uh, on the other hand, they make a big difference when they do occur. And so we mentally uh, are. Uh, vigilant to the circumstances in which they might appear. And of course, I mean, this goes without saying, but an awful lot of entertainment high and low is about sex and violence. That's almost a definition of uh, entertainment design for adults. Great, thanks. As you probably remember, in The Mind and Its Stories, I argue that there are a few story structures that turn up with great frequency ac across liter distinct literary traditions. These structures may be explained straightforwardly, in terms of agents pursuing goals defined by evolved emotion systems. The intensity, of, the intensity of the outcome emotion, for example, achieving the goal, is intensified by an increase in the gradient of change from a prior emotion. Put simply, it is fine if everything goes smoothly for the lovers, to take the case of romantic stories, but we are made happier by their eventual union if it appeared that they would be separated forever. These and a few other specifiable points serve to generate the cross-culturally recurring structures. In consequence, the structures are not, so to speak, direct evolutionary products, though they are to a great extent explained by adaptive, affective, and cognitive processes. In other words, by this account, narrative is not itself an evolved process or capacity. However, it does derive from evolved processes emotion systems, the ability to isolate particular causal sequences, speech, and so on. To what extent do you see narrative itself as an evolved process, perhaps something akin to a module? And to what extent do you see it as simply being explained by other adaptive processes? Yeah, I think that's, it's a key question, and I don't, uh, I don't have a firm opinion on it. I think there's an excellent uh, reason to think that the ability to imagine hypothetical and counterfactual scenarios is an adaptation. It's uh, very close to what the essence of intelligence is. Uh, and one can see how it has uh, allowed people in all cultures to develop uh, technologies and institutions and plans um, that, uh, that rely on foresight, planning, in fact, philosophers often say that uh, the very concept of causation depends on the concept of a counterfactual. What does A causes B mean? It means that if A hadn't occurred, uh, B wouldn't either. And so just the ability to say, if I do that, that would happen, but if I didn't, it wouldn't, um, compounded and, and, and multiplied, uh, that's really what thinking is, is almost for. And of course, we're social. Uh, we, the reason that we have language is that so that we can uh, share our insights with uh, with our companions. Um, it uh, it may be that just our sociality and our imagination you put them together and you get storytelling, or it may be that there's something about storytelling uh, that in addition to those that that combination um, that that is one of our our motives. Um, not easy to tell those uh, theories apart, but I think a, a fascinating project. One of the cross-cultural patterns I discuss in the mind and its stories is the sacrificial structure. This is somewhat unusual both in that book and in my subsequent affective narratology, which adds further structures to the original list. It is anomalous because the other structures treat things that we do in real life, pursue romantic love, fight wars, reunite with family members, take revenge, investigate crimes, and so on but we re don't really do much in the way of sacrificing people, at least in the direct sense that this often takes in literary works. 
I was therefore particularly interested in your discussion of human sacrifice in The Better Angels of Our Nature. Your aim in that book is to consider social progress, thus in that case, the fact that people gave up human sacrifice. But I would like to know more about how you believe sacrificial thinking operates and to what extent such thinking might still manifest itself indirectly today. Certainly such sacrificial stories as the fall of humankind and the redemptive death of Jesus continue to resonate with many people. In thinking about this, it may be helpful to distinguish between cases where the sacrificial victims are considered guilty and those where they are acknowledged to be innocent, in some ways, a more interesting case. It, it's a fascinating question, and it does speak to the tension that I and others have explored between apply in all cultures and all times and the undeniable fact of, uh, of historical change and, and, and moral progress, the fact that uh, human sacrifice really is a form of the crucifixion of Jesus, the ultimate human sacrifice. But we tend not to have new uh, plots, new themes about uh, you know, throwing virgins into volcanoes. Uh, and, and as you point out, the sacrifice uh, a Morse is, is, uh, is very, very much with us. But the sacrifice of an innocent in order to placate a vengeful God or, or, or evil bloodthirsty spirits, something that is largely foreign to current art forms. I mean, you may know of examples that, that, that I, I'm having trouble thinking of. I suspect that, and, and in cases where something changes that radically, uh, but clearly it was compelling in its time. I think the, 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 quest, the right question is the one that you ask, namely, is there some component of human psychology that is smaller than a human sacrifice ritual, but that explains why it was compelling when it was and that may have survived in other forms? And I suspect some of it is the idea that there is something morally beneficial about a, uh, about a sacrifice. We do know that is that it's inherently good to give up something that you uh, that you like. We, um, we we value people who do that uh, above and beyond the good that they do. And this is something that I have explored actually with a couple of graduate students, Jason Nemero and Julian De Freitas, uh, related to the movement called effective altruism, which seeks to. Oh, yeah channel human altruism to efforts that actually benefit the most people. The reason that effective altruism is even a thing, the reason that, you know, shouldn't all altruism be effective, but they point out that a lot of uh, philanthropy, a lot of charity consists of a kind of warm glow that has, may have dubious benefit to the, uh, the beneficiaries. And often it does consist of, a, uh, of some sacrifice. So uh, we would we uh, hold in higher esteem, say, someone who a wealthy person who uh, works in a soup kitchen once a week uh, and gives and, and ladles out soup to the homeless, even though that's a colossal waste of uh, human capital. Uh, anyone can ladle out soup, and that wealthy person would do much more good if they simply donated gobs of money to hire. Uh, dozens of, uh, of workers in soup kitchens or expand the soup and expand the kitchens and, and, and other ways of doing good. And effective also is sometimes promote uh, earning to give, that the most uh, moral thing you can do is make oodles of money and give it away to effective causes, something that uh, clashes with our intuitions. That does not strike us as particularly uh, moral, even though the argument could be made that it is. And we often um, esteem ascetics, uh, people who make conspicuous sacrifices, we often um, enhance the appeal of uh, charity by coupling it with, uh, with sacrifices. The ice bucket challenge for ALS, uh, you, you, you put a bunch of ice over your head, uh, various runs and swims and walks where you endure some ordeal in the service of, uh, of raising money. Uh, we venerate um, uh, ascetic uh, saints like Mother Teresa, who in, you know, cloaked in, in humble uh, white um, and, uh, and, and living in those who take vows of poverty. So the moral uh, value that we ascribe to asceticism and uh, sacrifice uh, may be 
the, core, the psychological core that's taken to an extreme in the cases of, uh, of animal and then uh, even more so human, human sacrifice. And it might, might ultimately have its basis in the fact that, uh, especially in a zero-sum context, one way in which you bestow a benefit on someone else is that you uh, relinquish it yourself, you forfeit it yourself. And so someone who's willing to do that uh, in, in a zero-sum environment will be doing more good than someone who hoards everything from, for themselves. In a complex economy where wealth is highly elastic, that may not be the most effective way to help people. Well, thank you very much. This has been very illuminating. Um, in conclusion, let me ask, are there any other areas or issues that strike you as being particularly relevant to the study of evolution and literary universals, or even questions or research topics you would like to see scholars and scientists pursue? Oh, where to begin? I, I think there's <laughs> a fantastically unexplored area of human scholarship of the intersection between uh, literature and other arts and, uh, and, human, and psychology um, that's barely been, been touched. I mean, the key, and uh, some of the efforts that you and I are familiar with some, from evolutionary psychology are an interesting start, but they tend to, I think, be just too narrowly focused on, on mating, on uh, uh, adaptive uh, uh, significance of particular themes, and that's just a, a taste of what could be explored. Uh, I would uh, I would also like to see, for example, the application of linguistics to poetry and, and literature, the use of language, what makes uh, elusive metaphorical language uh, effective, how do authors use tense and aspect to simulate uh, a, a, um, a ongoing events in the mind's eye, in the, in the mental theater, uh, how do... Uh, uh, how does the ordering of elements within a sentence, within a paragraph, contribute to the, the, the mise-en-scene, the development of, uh, of plot? Uh, in the study of emotion, what is the, uh, why, how does the balance between positive and negative emotions in our everyday life uh, provide materials that artists can use in, in the, uh, the pleasure taken in literature? Why, why would it be cruel to say to someone, you've got a fatal disease, and then say, oh, you know, it was a mistake, you're fine. Uh, that there, the negative would certainly outweigh the positive. No one would want that experience. On the other hand, in, in fiction, we kind of like that. You've got, unless you have your hero who's in trouble, your protagonist who has a near-death experience and then is saved, uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a boring plot. Why, why is there that, that contrast? Um, the... Uh, themes of human um, uh, motivation other than mating, including uh, status and knowledge and solidarity uh, and the built-in conflicts of interest in human relationships, the, the, the kinds of, uh, of genetic conflicts of interest that Robert Trivers uh, identified in um, romantic relationships, in parent-child relationships, in sibling-sibling relationships, in ally-ally uh, relationships, where each relationship has both an element of cooperation and an element of competition that work out in endless possibilities. Uh, all of these themes could, uh, I think, uh, not only add to our insight, our appreciation of, of art, but give me maybe even a shot in the arm in some of the branches of the humanities that are struggling to attract young talent and, and, uh, and, and funding. Uh, it's almost a cliche that the academic humanities are in, in trouble. Enrollments are dwindling. Uh, prestige is, is declining. Uh, this would not mean abandoning the uh, traditional goals of literary scholarship, which will always be important, but to enrich them with a new set of questions, a new set of methods, uh, a new set of bridges to other areas of human knowledge. I, that's uh, wonderful. Uh, that's, uh, I think, something that should uh, be heard by many humanists and uh, they would find it um, invigorating and uh, would uh, help foster a degree of optimism. So, uh, Thank you. And, and you, you've been at the, uh, the forefront of that. So your, your, uh, your works are, are beacons in that kind of investigation. Well, that's very sweet of you. Thank you. 
Well, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for doing this interview. And I, I think uh, viewers, visitors to the uh, Literary Universals Project website will find it extremely valuable and uh, very engaging and will be grateful to you also. So uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure, Pat. Thanks, thanks for having me on.